Hello, friends. My name is Harrison Owen. That's an identity check. And uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I should also tell you I'm a storyteller. And any of you who know anything about storytellers will know that we have a very light regard for the truth, um, which is another way of saying, please do not believe a single thing I'm going to tell you <laughs> until or unless the truth sort of pops out, which is what happens if you tell a good story. So I'm a storyteller, and my story is Dancing with Shiva. Or if you don't happen to know that particular lady or gentleman that's a little androgynous, try Sandy or Katrina. Um, this story is about dealing effectively with not only the chaos in our lives, but the way in which chaos becomes the opening door for emergent order. It's a suggestion that rather than just being the flotsam and jetsam in this world, we can, in fact, be active and contributory and effective participants in this dance. But we have to understand we do not design the dance, we don't control the dance, but we surely can do the dance. Let me put it in terms that I'm sure that everybody here in the uh, Jersey Shores will understand. Sandy was a major pain in every sense of that word. But it is equally true that you could not have a nice day at the beach were it not for the Sandys and her kindred over the centuries. Because the simple truth of the matter is those gorgeous beaches are in fact the product of the ultimate chaos and pounding which shatters prior structures and creates something new that we all enjoy. This story is, in fact, a very, very old one. It is back in the days of Indian history, 5,000 years ago, the story of dancing Shiva, the creator and the destroyer. A slightly different version with a different nuance shows up in China between the yin and the yang. It's not chaos or order. It's the dance in between. And of course, we have a new modern one. We call it chaos theory, complexity theory, emergence, you name it. But the bottom line is basically the same thing. Systems, all sorts of systems, that's you and me, our businesses, our countries, our towns, exist in a steady state until such time as the environment throws them out of their orbit, past equilibrium, into chaos, at which point one of two things happen. They go poof, dissipate, or they renew and reorganize or actually self-organize at new and higher levels of complexity. This is an emergent story for sure, but there we go. One of the side facts that most of us, I think, have found interesting as that story has been told is that chaos is no longer simply the enemy of whatever is. Chaos, in fact, ends up being the precursor the necessary precondition for new order. No chaos, no order. No chaos, no life. It is in the dance between chaos and order that new things emerge. At least that's the story that's being told. I think it's fair to say that there is an emerging scientific convergence at this point. And people are saying that birds do it, bees do it, galaxies do it. In fact, you might be driven, or I find myself driven, to two possible conclusions. After 77 years on the planet, I think this is the only thing I've actually learned. Number one, all systems. That includes 
little teeny ones like ant colonies to great big ones like the cosmos itself with us somewhere at the smaller end are open. We are all in an environment which is constantly pushing and shoving us in new possible directions. Now, if that happens to be true, there's an interesting correlation, or excuse me, consequence for our perceived or hoped for desire to be in charge or in control. We aren't. We can't think at that level. Second conclusion I found is all systems are self-organized which is the natural response for being in this turbulent, chaotic environment. And that has an interesting message for our management people, which includes basically all of us. Because what managers seem to be doing is organizing stuff. But if it turns out that it's all self-organizing, maybe we're working a little too hard. So here's the question. Can we learn? to ride the waves, the creative waves of chaos and destruction so that we can expand and enhance our own efforts. I didn't say control, but could we ride those waves to some purposeful future? I want to suggest that a possible answer, proof still out there, might have come through this 28-year natural experiment we've been conducting around the world called open space technology. For those of you who don't know, open space technology is just a very simple way to help people deal with highly complex, conflicted issues. Process, you won't believe it. Sit in a circle, create a bulletin board is, uh, identifying the issues that you want to talk about, open a marketplace to figure out the time and place when you're going to get together, go to work. That's it. That's all there is. And the amazing part is people do it all by themselves, self-organizing. Well, that sounds pretty abstract. Let me tell you a story, maybe bring it down, from some people that I suspect you've all heard about, AT&T. This is 1995. The Olympic Pavilion is about to come to life, AT&T along with other corporations, is building a pavilion. They have an expert crew of 20-odd folks, work 10 months, come up with an exquisite design, turn it into the Olympic Committee. The committee loves it and says, hey, would you like to move your pavilion from the edge of the global village to dead center, AT&T, since it's going to spend $200 million for one reason, exposure, says yes. Only problem is it's December, Olympics start in June. They knew it took 10 months, and anybody would know that you can't take a building that was built for the edge where they might have 5,000 visitors and move it to the center where they're going to have 75,000 and still have a building that's going to work. So they're back to square one. Count 10 months from December, the Olympics are over and you haven't even built the building. Guess what? 23 people sit in a circle, create a bulletin board, open a marketplace, and go to work. Two days later, at precisely 5 o'clock, everything stopped. Not because it was 5 o'clock, but because it was done. What they had done was a completely new building design down to the level of working architectural drawings. And I grant you it wasn't pretty, but it was there and it was working. Number two, they were further ahead with that building than they were with the previous design because while they were doing it, they were on their cell phones, stuff was hitting the ground in Atlanta. Number three, everybody agreed that it was aesthetically much better than what came before. And number four, which I noticed they didn't think about, they all loved each other. Any of you have worked in a really high pressure situation with a team, you can drive them to the wall, you may get the job done, and they all hate each other. These folks were hugging and kissing. But just notice, they managed to do in two days what they knew perfectly well was going to take them 
10 months. If you figure that out, it's a 15,000% increase in productivity. So what happened, that's what happened. What didn't happen is almost as interesting, I think. Number one, there was no advanced agenda. They walked in cold-footed flat. Two, nobody was in charge. Number three, there was no prior training. And oh yes, they did have a facilitator, that was me, who was largely known for taking long walks and naps and never intervened. <laughs> All right? I had a client one time said, Harrison, you've invented the ultimate scheme. You know, the client does all the work and you just take naps. <laughs> if you think about this, this violates absolutely every principle and practice of meeting management or management itself. I don't know of any that it doesn't. So, reasonable question. What on earth is going on? Could have been something in the water. Could have been massive good luck. It could have been a whole mess of things, except that we haven't counted accurately, but we, that's thousands of us all around the world, have done exactly the same thing somewhere between 250 and 300,000 times in 146 countries over 28 years with groups ranging in size from five to 3,500. And the results in every case have been comparable. I'm not about to say we always hit 15,000%, but it's been the same. So here's the big secret, I think. Remember, I'm a storyteller. Don't believe a word. <laughs> all systems, including all human systems, are fundamentally self-organizing. If that's true, just remember that organizing a self-organizing system is not only an oxymoron, it's stupid. <laughs> Particularly if the system could do a better job than you can. And the 15,000% factor, well, I take it as good news and bad news. The good news is, for all those folks who say we don't have the energy, the time, the spirit, the willingness, the human bodies to get the jobs on this planet done, I say, guys, take a break. We're 15,000% under utilization. We got a long way to go before we run out of steam. Or you can take the same number and I think make a useful critique. What we're doing is squandering 15,000%. A rough figure of our available energy and talent. So dancing with Shiva is an act of nature. It's a natural act. It's one we can do. So the waves are ours to ride. We have only to leave the beach, let go of this silly idea of being in control, and remember what any good surfer would tell you. If you think you're in charge of the wave, you're in deep trouble. Thank you.